What does it mean to be part of the connected generation? It really makes me feel part of a developing world. I'm expected to suddenly embrace technology when it's not what I'm used to and it's not what I prefer. I prefer writing and I prefer that more to the technology. So I think I would have been all right with that, but I don't think I would have been able to live without Google and the internet. To be part of the connected generation, it means that as teenagers, we live more through devices than we do actual interaction, which can be good and can also be really quite bad because we lose social skills, but we also gain information, I suppose. I feel like I'm more connected to the world and what's going on around me. Being part of the connected generation is a little bit better for the environment in some ways because we're allowed to send our drafts to our teachers via email instead of printing them out and wasting paper that way. Uh, I think it's a real privilege for us and we have so many opportunities now and we're connected with so many different things through the internet. Uh, for me personally, because I'm such a young person and gradually going through high school at the moment, I guess being part of the digital age, it's, um, it's nothing new since I've grown up with it. But people older than me, such as the rest of my family, my parents and my grandparents, they um, haven't grown up with it, so I guess it's new to them, but not really new to us. And it's quite an inspiration, I guess, um, for us to teach other people how to do this because we've grown up with it. We now live in a connected world where once people connected with people through conversations, phone calls, announcements, meetings and travel. Today, technology serves up this information within a continuous stream of ones and zeros. And this superhighway of free-flowing information is getting faster. It is happening instantly. Now, over a quarter of all people on the planet are connected to the internet, five times more than only 10 years ago. According to Australia's own National Statistical Bureau, 90% of young people aged 12 to 14 years use the internet for education and learning. 68% use it for email. Google is my <laughs> life. Google. And I think having the internet there, Google, well, <laughs> um, is like just amazing. These connected people, all two billion of them, are building a gigantic warehouse of information for future generations. They are building this through one trillion unique web pages and over 10 billion gigabytes of information each month. It will take only another two years to replicate what has happened in the last 10. A lot of this information is social and driven by our need to connect. Social networking site Facebook now has more than 500 million active users. Half of these log on in any given day. Acclaimed education and learning expert Mark Prensky has long referred to an emerging generation of digital natives. These are the people born into today's technology-rich world. With an average of 130 friends, it is estimated that each Facebook user helps contribute to over 900 billion minutes per month, sharing more than one billion pieces of content every single day. There is no turning back. But we can't simply rely on how far technology has come today to think about what it may look like tomorrow new frontiers are continually emerging. We have reached a true tipping point. Up until now, much of the technology still in use today was built by the pioneers of the technology age. These were first and second generation computer scientists and inventors from the 1960s and 70s. While quite recent history within the social schema, digitization is shortening time and driving massive leaps in technology. They were driven by efficiency they built technologies and systems to mimic life, only better, only faster. The in tray on your desk was replaced by the inbox in your email system. The trash can was replaced by the recycle bin on your desktop. The filing cabinet in the corner was replaced by the folder system on the mainframe. Your Rolodex became address book contacts. Your typewriter became your keyboard. Your paper clips became email attachments. Whiteout became the backspace key. Your desktop calendar, paper forms, stencils, and even the school bell have all been replaced. 
but until now, the world has remained recognisable at least, comfortable, better. However, the next generation has quietly moved into this new world and are seeing technology very differently. Not having experienced a life without a computer or the internet, and having never seen a typing pool, a stencil or a cassette, they are not restricted to our pre-internet perspectives. There is a gap between what you can do with technology and the kind of processes and education curriculum in terms of what it is actually teaching about technology to the kids and that gap is actually widening as technology continues to accelerate. The next generation will not be limited by using technology to do old things better. They will look at how to do new things that have never been done before. Uh, and I think that's part of the problem is, is where you tell kids that they can't bring technologies in and you want them to use the prescribed technology. It's almost going against you know, kind of normal society use of technology these days. People expect to be able to pick up any technology device and interact with it and access content from anywhere with it. And by restricting that, uh, the kids will just find ways to get around it. And even at a very tender age, they are showing their aptitude. Technology is now an extension of their learning tools. As some educational researchers have already observed, it is no longer enough to be able to read and write. Learning now requires multiple skills using digital technologies. We are witnessing evolution in real time. Smartphone adoption is edging closer to 50% of all phone users. It is estimated that one in two people will have a smartphone by the end of 2011. Today's teenagers have never known a world without mobile phones, and because they do more things with their phones than any other age bracket, they are expecting much more from these devices. Yes, the youth of today don't know a world without technology. They are stretching the limits and the boundaries. They are exploring and setting further frontiers than the previous generation could ever have imagined, and they are doing it from the bus stop. There was a time not so long ago when many parents wouldn't even let kids play with the television remote without supervision. I think yeah, different schools definitely have different levels of maturity around technology, both in terms of how they're using technology within the school, but also how they're applying that technology to the kids. But to me, what's really fascinating is you know, it's, it's adults that are looking at the technology and trying to apply that technology to kids, but it's fascinating watching kids who have never seen it before, never used it before, and have no prior thought about it, just picking it up and using it in a completely different uh, way because it's natural to them and it's quite a novel concept to them and you can watch the adults in there almost trying to tell the kids eat it out of them and use it the way I'm trying to prescribe to you uh, and you're seeing these kids just using it in you know, innovative ways that were never thought of and that then can create some other challenges uh, from that around you know the ethics and morals of what they're potentially doing with it uh, through to uh, trying to bring that back into a known format that you can do something with. Yet today's kids are literally being given the keys to billion dollar military equipment. In fact, their opinion is not only desired, it is actively sought. The ability for the next generation to adapt and quickly use technology has never been more clearly demonstrated than when the US Air Force turned to high school students to help them test the pilot training aids and flight control simulators for the fifth generation joint strike fighters, the F-35 and F-22 Raptor. Just exactly where are we headed? What does the future hold? For the US Air Force, starting the design for a flight training program for a fighter that was yet to be realised, the pilots who have not yet been born meant testing the simulation controls on the students of today. The US Air Force needed to ensure that the pilot training aides would quickly teach the critical skills of display management and multitasking that are crucial to flying a fifth generation fighter. When it's all broken down, these skills are not dissimilar to smartphone and game console usage. The new fifth generation machines, represented by the F-35 and F-22 Raptor, generate so much data from their host of sensors that the skills exhibited by the children of today are essential to process them. Forget real-time evolution. The time when humankind was constrained by its own ability is now past, and the forefront of this revolution is no longer big corporates, governments and defence laboratories. Look, I, I think enterprises need to be interacting with the education system and, and listening to what is happening in that education sector. If, if you're not doing that, ultimately what's going to happen is these kids are going to come out of an education environment where it's been collaborative, it's been involved, it's, it's actually been fun for them. 
and they're not going to want to work for you. They're going to come out, and as part of that job hiring process, they're going to look at that corporation and say, you know, it's it's old, it's traditional, it's not what I'm used to, and they're not going to be comfortable with it. And other organisations that have had that interaction and evolved themselves to match the next generation's expectations, that's where the talent is going to go. And that is ultimately going to be the failing for those enterprises. They won't be able to acquire and attract that talent. Today's classrooms are on the front line. That means education has changed forever. This is Jack. Jack is a multitasking expert and an information worker. Jack is only nine. But Jack can do his homework, watch a YouTube video, listen to music, download a song, play World of Warcraft, update his Facebook status and Yahoo message his best mate. All these Jack can do at the same time. Whilst all this is going on, Jack is busy processing multiple streams of information all at once. Today, students are able to access a range of perspectives and contribute their own voices while actively investigating how the world works. Such distracted behaviours of the modern human cyborg are challenging teachers to contemplate and take advantage of modern technologies to deliver better teaching and learning experiences. Uh, It used to be if they had their pen and paper and their textbook, you knew that they were relatively on task. Uh, Now that they they can be off... um, checking their emails, they can be surfing the web, they might be watching a video, and they're doing a lot of other things when maybe you just want them doing a particular thing. Um, they're multitasking, they're, they might have multiple windows open switching between them, and so um, yeah, it takes a bit of work to monitor that in the classroom. But then also there's like distractions as well that you can always have with intranet, internet, like uh, Facebook and all that sort of stuff. I do find quite often they're trying to send emails to each other, um, they're checking their Facebooks or... They're trying, they're trying anything. Um, they're trying to do other things apart from the work. Um, some of the kids really embrace it, though. Um, but, yeah, there's definitely some, some difficulties with some kids that can't control themselves. That's what technology does. It's very distracting. But it is a big help because you can multitask much better. There are challenges. Um, some of the challenges are, for example, uh, when they're on the computers, is, is making sure that they're on task. We have some tools here which help us to, to do that. You know, we can actually see what the students see on their screens. Uh, we're able to, to view that and, and interact uh, with the students and talk to them about what they're up to. So as the new technologies come in, it's changed the way we do some of the things in the classroom, and uh, there are challenges. Um, some of the challenges that uh, we face in the classroom are um, to do with the ethical Um, expectations of the teacher-student relationship and how much interactivity there can be as far as um, using um, internet-based technologies and things like that. The other type of technologies, you know, we see mobile phones, we see iPods, um, those kind of things happen in class. So students might be uh, working on a particular task and they might listen to their iPod at the same time sometimes uh, and they're happy to do that. And uh, I had a class the other day where a student was going off doing some work elsewhere in the school and I wanted to find out what they're up to and one of the other students says, well, why don't you just phone them? I've got their number here. And so they phone them up (laughs) in the other part of the school And, and so the technology can be a distraction, having their phones in the class does distract them at times, but other times it's a real tool that they can use. Yeah, I, think, I think the improvements in technology will make them more information efficient. So they'll be able to find information, interact with that information, consume that information at a fast, at a, at a far faster rate than what we can today. Whether they're actually getting the value from that information and able to create the patterns of understanding across these vast information sets is yet to be seen. Such is his ability to consume and process multiple streams of media, 
new research is highlighting that Jack has the capability to consume 8.5 hours worth of media in only 6 hours of time. He is Generation C. C for connected. Considered lazy and overindulged by many, they are in fact almost 42% better equipped than baby boomers and Gen Xers to efficiently process information within the modern environment. As we do new things, introduce new technology, they just become more aware of it. And what we used to do in year 12, they now do in year 10. And then those ones that you do in year 10, they do in year 8. And probably even more so, some of the stuff we do in year 12 years ago, they do in year 8 now. Many young teachers joining the workforce today are Generation Y. As educators, they are faced with a significant opportunity. It's changed dramatically since I went through, uh, where you're just copying things off blackboards, um, watching some old old VCR um, recordings for science. Um, now what I can do is I can show PowerPoints, I can show YouTube videos, um, I can do a whole range of things, I can send emails to them, um, I can send them resources when they're away, um, they can catch up on anything that they miss. Jack's generation has access to streams of information on a scale that has never been seen before. They have ready access to laptops or family computers and the internet is ready to serve up information to them from over one trillion web pages. In generations past, schools consisted of single-roomed classrooms with rows of fixed seats, blackboards, chalk dusters, slate boards and slate pencils. The memories of school for today's generation will consist of touchscreens, interactive atlases and resources, and class blogs linked to geographic information systems for virtual fieldwork experiences. Some schools are already using iPads for all sorts of linked activities. Smart electronic whiteboards that can email are already considered old technology. Multimedia presentations are a student's assignment staple. While touchscreen tablet laptops and data projectors, productivity suites and email, thumb drives and smartphones, Google, Facebook and iPads are here to stay. You see, Jack was born into the technological age, right into the middle of a generational shift. I think the te technology is definitely changing the learning styles of children. Uh, you know, it's especially with some of the newer interfaces. You know, touchscreen technology, for example, is just so intuitive to use. It's all about gesture-based browsing, and you don't need to train somebody about. It. You don't need to know the alphabet and use a keyboard to understand that. You know, what the letter A is on the keyboard, versus to just using your finger and uh, drawing a pattern on the screen. And I think kids are again because they've got no. Um, prior conceptions about how to use technology, they can pick that device up and start interacting with it. And it's, you know, it's flashy, it's, it's graphical for them, it plays sounds. And so it's that natural feedback that kids are looking for. It's just a toy in some ways to them. I don't think they actually understand what's sitting behind that technology and all the capabilities that that actually unlocks for them. Research shows that more kids can play a computer game today than know how to ride a bike. Even at the tender ages of two and three, 44% know how to play a computer game, while 43% know how to ride a bike. All told, 58% of children aged 2 to 5 know how to play a computer game today, while 19% of kids aged 2 to 5 know how to play with a smartphone application. Only 9% those ages know how to tie their shoelaces. Furthermore, more children can open a web browser than swim unaided. This research clearly shows parents and educators need to start educating kids about navigating the online world safely at an earlier age than they might otherwise have thought. In fact, Jack's generation is so accustomed to accessing and processing information that they already have advanced skills in computer operations. Web searching, social networking and gaming are all learned before ABCs. Due to exposure to technologies, these are naturally developing skills, not onerous tasks. Jack has never known a day without being surrounded by technology, devices and computers, and he has to process information and multitask throughout his entire day. At the end of his day, Jack completes his homework after using a search engine to apply the skills he learned in school today. He typed it in using Word, embedded the PowerPoint slide and downloaded the images he wanted to use off Flickr. Tomorrow he will complete his latest blog, an interactive class project to foster collaboration with teachers and his peers. He will be creating without knowing it, reflecting on his process or the information that he found. According to Bloom's revised taxonomy, by doing these ICT-related activities, he is able to apply a higher order of thinking. Once complete, Jack uploads his work into the school portal and submits his work online for his teacher to review the next day. While he might not always feel like contributing during the day, 
His online educational tools provide him another effective opportunity to contribute his thoughts on the week's debate or general discussion. I think one of the fascinating things is this generation that's coming through now, they're growing up with technology and by the time they come into the workforce, they're going to be so advanced in their use of technology and how they want that technology to assist them that it's going to be you know, chalk and cheese to how we currently use technology. Technology is not standing still and the education system is comparatively moving with it. Where once the question may have been whether or not today's children are overindulged, is it really a question of giving them everything they want? Or has the ground shifted forever regarding the passive role of the student? Is their appetite for information greater than ever? Where the old way of teaching and learning was didactic and teacher focused, teaching pedagogy has shifted in the last few decades to be more student focused. The opportunity is ripe for educators ready to embrace technology. After all, it is not a large pedagogical leap for educators, but a technological one. I think there is definitely a um, digital divide and certainly um, Prensky's digital natives and digital immigrants support that idea. That theory looks at um, people who have grown up with technology. It's part of who they are and how they communicate and how they've developed as individuals, as opposed to generally the older population who haven't had that access to technology and so they're more um, immigrants to the idea of technology. And so they've had to learn their skills and learn new communication technologies and communication styles. So I think it's definitely based on a digital divide. I think it is not... Um, insurmountable, it can actually be bridged and that people from different generations can become tech savvy. In the earliest days of computing, information technology was a science. The giant mainframe computers and the reels of magnetic tape were the domain of scientists in white lab coats. The computers were gigantic. These machines would fill entire floors of buildings. They would read punch cards and spew out pages of computations and calculations. Over the decades, information technology has moved out of these computer room warehouses and into homes, workplaces and the schools. Technology now permeates every corner of our lives. The choice of the individual to participate is now gone. Technology has passed its point of inevitability. Technology is now accessible and available to all generations. It is available across all walks of life, in every moment of every day. Technology no longer requires a lab coat, it is the domain of all of us. We use technology, we control it, and it controls us. We live with it, and we can't live without it. Technology is no longer something that an IT department does. Today, entire workforces are technology-aware information workers. In our schools, students now experience technology very early. We teach them how to build websites and how to query a database. By the time today's school generation joins the workforce, they will have learned how to write a computer program, if only to customise their Facebook page or write their own applications. They know how to build a computer, if only to hack or break a proprietary smartphone. And although they may no longer learn French, Italian, German or Japanese, they will know how to write in a database query language, the new language. And they will know how to build and use complex cube databases that can do computations that only 30 years ago could only be done by the scientists using those monolithic mainframe computers. Even the early scientists would not have imagined how far technology has taken hold. The race is now to build technology that can learn and teach itself. This will be the future of today's application installation wizards. Computers will adapt and change according to how we use them. And yet in this race for technology, at the speed it is now running, it is people that are getting left behind. Many of today's elderly are left to ponder how they will cope in this new connected world. How will they pay their bills? How will they interact with their own grandkids? The generation gap has now been replaced by the digital divide. In this generation, kids communicate in a new language within a 140 character context. It is a language of abbreviation and codes that choke the information highway through applications like Facebook, Twitter and through SMS. Even the baby boomers are living in the online world. However, their own kids, Generation C, the connected ones, are fast leaving them behind and this widening gap is causing anxiety in the home, at schools and in the uncontrollable world at large. As today's children are empowered by new technologies at a younger and younger age, 
at a faster and faster pace, how will parents and guardians and authorities continue to keep them safe? The digital divide is only growing bigger. As far as uh, behaviour, social interactions, social development skills are concerned, that um, the tech-savvy digital natives certainly come up with um, an interesting view of life because they have grown up with technology. They tend to um, write in tech speak quite a bit, certainly in emails and things like that. Um, so getting them to take a step back and to um, still try to adhere to some of the social norms that are expected, social behaviours, can be a bit of a challenge. But um, I don't think it's anything at the moment that is um, too detrimental to Australian society. To have less social skills, it, mean, it basically means that we don't, we more speak to each other over the internet and things like Facebook and MSN, people still use it. And so it's harder to talk in person. Um, having a social element to school is really good because you get, you know, you look forward to your lessons because you get to communicate with teachers and you get to ask questions that would be harder to ask from home. And you also get to, you know, connect with your friends and meet new people through schooling. But while if you're at home, you don't, you lose that ability to talk to people and it becomes more over computer and it's a lot, you lack kind of the fate, like the relationships that you can build through being face to face. I think there is a bit of a divide um, between parents and their children um, with the digital age. Um, I think mainly with social networking and things, um, a lot of the parents aren't really sure how to how to access it um, or how to use it themselves. Um, and then you might find that the students, um, they spend a lot of time on there and interact with each other rather than um, with a generation that isn't connected. I think technology is increasing the social skills of the students because uh, they're given an extra opportunity um, in, order to, in order to interact with each other um, and with their teachers and with their parents. Um, and I, I just think it gives it an extra option um, to communicate rather than just face to face? Um, well, it's definitely easier to stay connected because you don't always have to see them, but there are always limitations to that because you can't really have a one-to-one -one discussion. I think one of the most important things that is, is happening um, in relation to technology and education is that teachers and schools are aware of the um, pastoral care required of ensuring that the normal um, social behaviours and acceptable communication styles are still um, talked about, they're still encouraged. I think is a bit of a myth that the whole idea that technology is hindering social development. I don't think that's true. I think um, it can actually be enhancing social development in that the people who may might not like to um, go out and interact too much still have an ability to take part in a, um, a social forum. They might focus on something they particularly love, which might not be cool, but they're able to still do that um, in an effective way and communicate that. We need to sort of look at how we continue to maintain traditional people skills <laughs> as well as their digital skills, uh, but they are, I think they are always communicating a lot more than maybe we're used to. And even in class, uh, they're, they're doing a lot more collaborative work. They're communicating as in groups, uh, they're sharing blog spaces, they're doing a whole bunch of things, which, uh, which means that they're, they're communicating more, but also communicating less in our traditional way. So we have to try and work out where the right balance is. Certainly as students have more access to different technologies, such as email, uh, Twitter, Facebook, iPhones, things like that, there is more of a chance that they are going to be communicating more. And um, I think... Um, can break down those isolations as well. The digital divide also has a dark and insidious side. Whether it be a phishing email or a credit card skimmer at an ATM or on a passing iPad, criminals who know far more about technology than the average person are using the digital divide to their own evil advantage. Technology is now the tool of trade of the smarter criminal. It is no longer the balaclava and the crowbar. It is the combination of the PC, software, malicious intent that is the real threat. It is estimated that one cyber crime can pay for more than a lifetime of burglaries with much less risk and effort, whether it be the predator laying a web to catch unsuspecting children, or the hacker who steals identities and passwords to raid the bank accounts of the unwary online shopper, 
or vandals who hack into tribute sites to deface and spread their brutal ugliness on innocent victims. The digital divide provides criminals with the opportunity to strike on an unsuspecting connected community. Unfortunately, such behaviour now also permeates the education system, where cyber bullies and sexters attack or extract revenge on hapless victims. It's really important we have to be more aware of internet safety because while we can, it's useful for research, it can also be dangerous. Um, I think technology is creating a problem with cyberbullying. Um, where uh, I, I find a lot of kids are sending emails to each other, um, and a lot of it, a lot of it is negative things. Some of it's a bit of teasing. Some of it's just things like drawing pictures um, and editing them in in ways that some people might find offensive. Um, but it does give them another avenue um, rather than just face to face bullying, uh, where they can do it. They can bully, I guess. Um, in private and not many people really know or take notice of what's going on. Yeah, I suppose sometimes it can be quite scary if people are like bullying you on the internet, even though <laughs> sometimes it can happen at school too. Well, I think there's definitely the cyberbullying that, that happens. Uh, that's unfortunate. Uh, but bullying has always happened. Um, in some respects, it's easier. In some respects, it's harder because now there's complete audit trail. <laughs> and if there is bullying, it is uh, quite often easy to go, well, here's the emails and, and I've got the evidence of it. But at the same time, as well as the cyber bullying, there's the, the flip side to that, which is that connected connectedness and that support network that they have with each other, uh, which they gain through using Messenger and Facebook and email and these other systems, which really allows them to support each other and work together and help each other out. Um, and so there are some good things about community, which they gain through technology as well as the bad. And I think the media really does focus on the bad uh, and doesn't necessarily focus on some of the good things that are happening in the way that they are communicating better uh, as a result of these things that are coming through. So whilst the National Broadband Network and Computers in Schools promises so much for our education system, it won't bridge this digital divide on its own. It may even accelerate the challenges before ushering in great benefits. So what will? I think, I think some of the changes you'll see in the connected generation is that they will have an expectation to have access to information in real time. They're not going to be very patient in terms of requesting access to information and having to wait to have you know, an application installed or get permission to it. If they don't get that real time access, they'll just go elsewhere and find that information somewhere else or just put it in the too hard basket and switch to working on something else. And I think that's going to be one of the big changes between you know, Gen X, Y, to Generation Connected is that real-time access to information all of the time from any of those devices that they're used to accessing. As the baby boomer generation grows old and outnumbers all other generations that precede them, how will technology help? Will the connected generation, with all their technological literacy, become the answer to the ageing population? Will they open new doors to innovation and creativity that will allow for an economy that can support the growing elderly ranks? One thing is for sure, the increased technological literacy of the connected generation will provide us many answers and possibilities. Whether or not it will open new doors to innovation and creativity is a given. Whether or not they will provide the answers to today's problems is irrelevant. Those problems are ours to correct. Tomorrow belongs to the children and their future does lie within the education system. And it is the responsibility of that system and not the technology used by that system to provide the answers. The ability to shape the education system to meet the challenges of the digital divide lies squarely within the reach of today's generations to mould and shape. Doing nothing is not an option. Doing things the same ways with new technology is not an option. Is it even something that can be controlled? Embracing fundamental change through innovation is our only hope. What will become of human nature if we don't take account of the potential of technology to influence human interactions, the way we live and the way the world connects? And if we continue our reliance on technology, what would happen if one day it all disappears? What humanity have we erased from our world? What have we lost forever? I think there are challenges between the public and private education systems. Uh, there is 
there is some digital divide between them. Uh, already, like our our program here, we have uh, a laptop program where students can take their machines home. I know there's a lot of schools in the pub, in the state system where that's not happening. Uh, some are, uh, and so there are challenges there. I think there's a lot of support that needs to occur uh, at the moment with the technology between uh, to to support us behind the scenes with teachers and and the infrastructure. I don't always see that kind of support in some of the state schools. Uh, that will probably change. I hope it does change. I would would like to think that there is more access available for more people and um, certainly as more policies come through the different systems of government and as different technologies become even more accessible to education systems and educational um, institutions then I would think that access to technology will become less of an issue. But there is that there is that risk that there will be a digital divide between the different systems, uh, but it does take, I think, with enough support from, from government and resources and, and schools with that approach, uh, they need to do that. I know that technology and education has been a big priority for governments, state, federal governments, to get the technology into the classrooms. And I, um, that has certainly been a focus and I know there has been improvements there. I know that in the private sector that um, there there is an understanding that in order to be current and to actually develop students who will go out as citizens who can communicate and participate in the world, then there is a, an onus on the school to actually provide some technological education as well. What I see in some schools is the government who have given the money, um, maybe just saying, well, I've got this money, I need to go and spend it. Uh, not necessarily looking at the way in which that's going to transform their curriculum and transform the way they do things. That's just something that they just have to do. Uh, at the moment, we're on a real stage where we can tra change the way things are done. Uh, completely. We can change uh, the way in which systems are done. We can change the way in which teaching occurs. And it takes a, a bit of vision to do that. And I think we've got a real benefit here of having a principal who does have a vision uh, and uh, has seen the way in which it's changing and has really picked that up and, and, and is running with that and helping us through that process. So I believe that it will continue to be a priority for any part of the education system to include it and for people to have access. Is the future unquestionably bright in the classrooms of tomorrow, or is it really just the potential that is so bright? In Australia today, mega projects such as the National Broadband Network are a perfect example of opportunity that does not on its own guarantee a bright future. And as was the case with the first attempts of technology to change the world in which we live, there will be things within education that will remain the same. Without serious attention, it may well be the case of history repeating unless someone asks whether or not we have learnt the lessons from the first 50 years of technological invention. With specific regard to education, there is the potential for so much more than simply replacing the in-tray on the desk with the inbox in the email system, or the trash can under the desk with the recycle bin on the desktop. Education has many bastions that will surely open to change in the coming generations. Is it enough to say that we will simply use more technology within the existing education system? Sure, that's comfortable, but what will that change? It may look smarter, but it won't necessarily ensure higher order thinking or meaningful improvements. I think one of the big challenges for IT managers in the future or IT departments in the future is going to be you're going to have people entering the workforce who have already had 10, 15 years of experience using a particular technology platform, whether it be you know, Microsoft or Apple or the Googles of the world. And when they come into the corporate world, if you're going to prescribe to them that you must use the corporate standard, they're almost effectively going to have to relearn from start again. And you're going to be throwing away 10 to 15 years of good experience that they've already built up. And effectively, they're not going to be as efficient potentially on the corporate platform as if you were more flexible and trusting of them to say, actually, why don't you bring your technology in, you use your platforms that you've already been learning for the last decade and use that within the corporate environment. And that, that's a big game shift in terms of how corporate departments think in the enterprise market. Will the Monday to Friday school week or the nine to three school day change? For generations, the school working agenda has mimicked the working agenda of parents and professionals. As change continues to quickly creep into other industries and organisations, why shouldn't we expect similar change in schools? Yes, yeah, so I think you know, if CIOs went out to schools today and saw uh, kids interacting with technology, I think they'd be quite surprised at how advanced it actually is and how much collaboration is occurring 
not only between the students themselves, but also between some of those advanced teachers who are really embracing that technology and that there's a real mentor, you know, kind of learning and development environment that's been created around the use of that technology and it actually spreads outside of the school. You know, we're seeing teachers interacting with kids outside of traditional school environments and out of school hours and I think CIOs still very much think today in Monday to Friday, nine to five, that's how the IT systems work. Uh, schools are moving away from that environment quite rapidly and I, th I think that would be a real eye-opener to a lot of CIOs that just how evolved that actually is these days. Will the physical classroom or the school library being on the school grounds change? Concepts such as school as a service will see virtual schools move to the data centre and the school textbook or library moving to the cloud. I think a school as a service is quite an interesting concept in that it's, it is still very new and I don't think it's been uh, ratified yet. It's still evolving quite rapidly. Uh, I think the, the virtual school is more about becoming a meeting place for people to learn. And what will be interesting is those people may not be in the same geographic location. They may actually be quite dispersed. And instead of having you know, one teacher for a year group, it's quite possible that you'll have multiple subject matter experts who come in for their particular areas. What will the implications be for the publishing and education industries as fully searchable e-textbooks are outpaced by kindergarten, or as more students interact directly with authors through online blogging or paid educational services? How will the education system deal with students creating content for mass publication? Who will own the intellectual property and where will it reside? Will the 24 by 7 school classroom or avatars attending on the student's behalf be a major change? The relationship between teachers and students is changing rapidly. It is no longer one of authority and passivity, but nor is it simply about Gen X principles replacing baby boomers to allow closer working relationships with today's students. The emergence of virtual classrooms as alternate educational channels will surely continue their movement towards institutional status. These 24 by 7 classrooms will completely change the nature of the student-teacher relationship from one of transactional based learning to that of interactional and experiential based learning. I think the, the, the traditional view of the teacher will change and evolve and you know, it will move from being that authority figure and sitting at the front of a classroom and all the kids sitting there paying 100% of attention to a teacher to evolving to a teacher is more of a knowledge worker and a mentor and not that it's not a one-way discussion anymore. The kids are going to be sitting there yeah, potentially even in a collaborative environment not facing the teacher working on their tablet devices and laptops and the teacher is going to be having to assist those kids and have different skills in identifying where the kids are getting stuck uh, and how to help them instead of just lecturing one way to them. Using technology drives a different trust relationship between the students and the teacher and you're absolutely right. Some kids will learn faster than others. Uh, I think one of the things that technology will ultimately bring is it will actually change the structure of a school. In 2011, we still structure schools around the kids' manufacture date. It's not about their actual ability around different things. And kids have different abilities in different subjects. Some kids are going to be naturals at math, some kids at language, some at arts and craft. But trying to treat them all the same based on a, the year that they were born is, is a, such an artificial concept that it actually limits kids, I think, to a large degree. Sure, these 24-7 classrooms won't invent student-teacher interaction, but they will represent an efficient alternative to traditional school setups. With the emergence of these new classrooms will also come the requirement for the virtual student body and one day the ability of avatars to replace sick or absent students on the daily attendance role. Much of today's social development is driven by schools and not by the parents who are too busy to raise their kids. The coming challenges for the system will be driven by social goals, including the pastoral side to today's schooling, where youths are prepared to participate in society. Technological innovation in education is not about replacing like for like. It is not about replacing workbooks with laptops. It is about as far from that pioneer age view of technology as you can get. Yes, the whiteboard-blackboard transition or replacement is a necessary change. So, so classrooms are, are definitely changing. Um, the way in which they uh, are able to cater for the different learners. Um, there are times in which our technology, our, our teaching styles uh, need to adapt to that. Uh, we have to learn as teachers a whole bunch of new micro skills uh, on how to manage a class and how to um, set up our curriculum to handle different learning speeds, different learning styles. One of the best things about technology in education is that you're able to, or well, teachers are able to differentiate between 
um, the students in the class and those that need a little bit of extra help um, can be working autonomously um, just as someone who needs extension work. Uh, they can be working autonomously as well. We can um, connect these students in ways that will allow them to develop their own um, uh, leadership skills and also to extend those students who may um, be a little bit um, slower to pick up some concepts. So it really does provide some flexibility to um, the learning process and certainly the teaching process with that differentiation of, um, of teaching and learning styles. We're no longer tied to the, the, to the slowest learner. Uh, it means that we can set up to activities which are a little, little bit more open-ended. Uh, students can go off and do research and can investigate things which they never used to be able to do. If it was in a textbook, that's what you got. Now they can go off and find the best law lecturers, the best scientists uh, in whatever field they're interested in. And they can find material directly from them and they can expand and they can find others and compare and contrast, whereas in the past they didn't have quite that same capability. But today's students will not look to replace like for like. They will create other futures, like gaming interfaces to business applications. Whether or not an examination is held inside a school gymnasium will simply be missing the point. Um, I think the school of the future, um, the way it's going at the moment, I think it's going to turn out where there isn't, there's no paper and pens. It's all going to be, it's all going to be digital. Um, where all the students, well, they're all going to be digital natives, so they're not going to have any problems at all. Um, using technology. A bit curious about what's going to happen in the future, whether there'll be new digital ages and we'll be taught by other, um, our newer generations after that. In order for progress to be made, we need to go back and take a good look at ourselves and reflect on what we were before we came to what we are now. It'll be different, but like school now is so much different to the way school used to be. So... Yeah, I just think it's just going to keep changing. Uh, what does the school of the future look like? It's a, it's a tricky question. Um, I can see the way it's changed so much already um, and there's a lot more flexibility for schools to change in the future. Maybe we won't have any need for teachers or we might not even have to go to school at all. We'll probably be able to, if we are away sick, we can just like sit at home and watch what the teacher's doing or whatever or they can record it and email it to us and then we just watch the lesson. Maybe we might not even go to school. We might just have a desk at home with yeah. a t television. <laughs> Maybe we could do clones and someone could be the smart one, the athletic one. I reckon that there'll probably be virtual teachers that just sit at home and then they, you know, talk to you through a screen. Yeah, no more textbooks, no more school uniforms and no more teachers, yeah. We might even have no teachers at all. We might just have you know, robots as our teachers. I think students would like to think that teachers maybe won't be needed in the classroom of the future, that we'll all be online and they'll be talking to robots and still learning to the extent that they're learning now. But I think what needs to happen is that step back from the idea of technology and just remember it's about education. And that really can only come from collaborative learning, from meaningful learning activities and social interaction. I also think that in the future it's still important to have that interaction uh, with the teachers and with writing as well so we don't lose spelling, punctuation and that basic technique so that we don't become so reliant on technology that it becomes a flaw in one sense. You could even study from home with like you know the technology and you could just connect to the school and go from home make it easier for a lot of people but also it's kind of you're lacking that social um, element to it. I reckon that the future classroom will like have interactive desks so like you can just drag your book and it will be open and you can like write on your desk but it will be like a computer thing. I used to have science textbooks as well but now it's kind of just shortened down to like just carrying one or just carrying the discs like kind of like the books will be put onto discs and then that you use those on your computer instead. I don't think it's been in any of the technologies been invented yet, or I think there might be a secret vault somewhere in Switzerland where all of this technology and they're just petering it out to us. If I send my kids to school, it, I can see a classroom that has um, excellent ways, excellent new ways of um, developing their education and fueling their minds. A lot of the grades, like even primary school, might have computers instead of them learning how to write. Um, I think it'll be pretty much the same except just better technology, like the computers will be more advanced and 
everyone will have them. You'll have TVs around the school showing your notices and you'll have like, um, you'll probably carry just like a small little portable device that you know, it's kind of is your textbook or your has your things on it for the lesson. I certainly wouldn't advocate the idea of avatars too much, but I think um, the, you know, video hookup, if it has to get to that point, would still be okay. But I think the classroom environment where students can sit together and work in a group and touch and feel um, resources and really come to a strong understanding. Um, they could be working together with laptops, but all working on different elements of the end goal and they can see it and they can touch it and they can be motivated by each other's learning. You can't have that if you don't have a classroom or at least some sort of collaborative learning happening. Uh, I, think, I think we'll definitely have the same amount of teachers in the future. I don't think you can replace um, having a teacher in the classroom where you can get help instantly um, face to face for extra explanations rather than um, through video chats or um, through emails. I think you really need to have that that face to face contact. I think it's very hard to predict and I still see a teacher or let me say a leader in learning and I still see students needing to understand the context of their learning and whether that means a heap of technology and even more innovative tools to pull that learning together and present and create and um, either that or we'll be back out under the tree having a chat about life. We'll still have teachers? Yes. <laughs> Someone needs to keep an eye on us. Great. Great. That's, that's <laughs> excellent.